following up on our commitments to the people, making your future work better. Thank you. Thank you very much, Program Director, Honorable President of the IPU, Honorable Presiding Officers, Honorable Members, Fellow Delegates and Distinguished Guests, dear friends. On behalf of the delegation from South Africa, I wish to express our great appreciation for the kind and welcome, warm welcome we've received in this beautiful country since our arrival. We thank the leadership and the people of Spain for their unmatched hospitality and kindness as hosts of this assembly. We are meeting during the most difficult period in our lifetime where the world is faced with unprecedented and unique challenges as a result of the deadly COVID-19 pandemic and its resultant hardships. The prevalence of COVID-19 state of disaster and its resultant impact on the global economy has undoubtedly left no one unaffected with millions having lost both lives and livelihoods since the beginning of last year. Of even more concern is the fact that we are not at a point where we can project the exact end point of the pandemic. We need to acknowledge the spirit of human solidarity and partnerships that we have seen all over the world as humanity confronted the unprecedented challenges that threatened our way of living and the world as we knew it. Not only did the pandemic result in the loss of millions of lives across the globe, but it has caused immense damage to the economic and social stability in the developing nations of the world in general and developing countries in particular. It is for this reason that South Africa has come out in support of the call for the World Trade Organization to waive specific trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights regarding the production and access to life-saving COVID-19 vaccines. We believe this is a noble call, as it will not only enable the local manufacturing of COVID-19 drugs and related vaccines, but also allow extended and universal access to locally manufactured vaccines and other drugs at reasonable price. Your Excellency, Mr. President, this situation regarding the equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines is a typical example that exposes the inherent fault lines of our system of world governance, as it reflects the skewed experiences of democracies for citizens of the world. Vaccine nationalism and exclusivism must come to an end. In the context of the topic of the day, the question we should ponder is, to what extent has democracy been a people-centered system? Can democracy be a catalyst for human development beyond its structural measures of indicators and checks and balances? The universally accepted established definition of democracy is one that concerns itself with a form of government, a system where the people have a voice in the manner in which they are governed and the power to participate in decision making. The system is also measured in terms of various indicators, including but not limited to holding of frequent elections, good governance, freedom of the press, the independent judiciary, an institutionalized system of accountability, and the civil rights and freedom of citizens. Over the past century, more countries have taken to the system of democracy, signaling a global acceptance of this form of government and the best to advance humanity and address our shared challenges going forward. Since then, democracy has served to level the political playing field and created a system of order where there are none in certain instances. It has empowered all of humanity to have a say and participate in affairs of their countries. It has brought about the recognition of rights of women, the protection of vulnerable sectors, for example, the LGBTQI community, and promoted accountability and central planning for the usage of public resources. 
The system of democracy has also facilitated cooperation of nations and urged us towards world peace and hopefully the end to war. The question remains, however, whether it can be a system whose success can be determined through a common measure, given that societies, nations and regions have been built from different and unique historical contexts. Democracies are anchored on the need to build strong institutions as they are needed to ensure accountability and protection of the rights and freedom of people, freedoms of people. Within the context of an increasingly globalized economy, which remains unequal, how do these democratic institutions play a role in supporting a strong agenda for the socio-economic development of the billions of poor people who live in democracy all over the world? It is to survive, it, if it is to survive, it is important that democracy becomes responsive to the socio-economic plight of all the people in the system and not just about the structural indicators as integral and as important as these may be. To ensure that democracy as a system protects its own legitimacy and demonstrates the moral authority required by the governments to govern. Failure to do this will create an additional set of unintended challenges for systems as it will ultimately cause a popular backlash against democracy, albeit populist-led, giving rise to opportunism, polarization of communities, and demagogy. Your Excellencies, the express objectives of the IPU is to promote democratic governance, accountability, and cooperation amongst its members, as well as to advance the cause for gender equality, youth empowerment, and sustainable development. Part of the work we will conduct in committees we have conducted, of course now committees have been sitting during this session, will deal with areas and the role of the IPU and member nations in the protection of human rights. I'm certain that the discussions in committees took place within the context of this discourse on the contemporary challenges facing democracy. Not only should the discussions be about respect for the rule of law and the protection of human rights, but also about the right to access justice. It should mean taking practical steps to establish democratic institutions that reflect the diversity of a population in terms of gender, language, religion, and ethnicity. Repealing anti-discrimination laws to ensure an equitable distribution of opportunities for everyone. It is about the concrete effort to fight all forms of corruption and malfeasance. In addition, and of critical importance, it is the need for us to ensure that all institutions of state established to exercise oversight over the executive, including parliaments, are given enough political, legal, and human resources to perform their duties diligently. Everything should be done to ensure the executive upholds its obligation under the constitutional and international law to protect the life and health of, of the people. In this regard, as I conclude, we must also warn against a disturbing trend that also threatens to exercise the existence of viable democracies, where we are witnessing democratically elected governments increasingly adopting authoritarian tactics to squash dissent, especially in the context of the COVID-19 state of emergency and disaster. This has been the form of, in the form of arrest, detentions, and prosecution of journalists, medical personnel, and many others for allegedly spreading misinformation and fake news, implementing aggressive measures to curtail freedom of expression and that of the press. Your Excellency, I see that I'm one minute over, and my apologies. It has been proven on numerous occasions that in every war, instability, insecurity, famine, outbreak of killer diseases and pandemics, women are the most affected. Statistics are showing that incidences of women abuse and violence against women have increased since the outbreak of COVID. We call it the second pandemic in South Africa. Thank you very much.
Following up on our commitments to the people, making your future work better.